Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this video, we're going to be discussing metaplasia. So if you guys haven't already done so, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel because your support really means a lot to us and we really appreciate it. So with that being said, let's discuss metaplasia by first talking about the cellular adaptations that are very important that occur uh in metaplasia essentially our cells are constantly under a lot of stress because of the environment that they are in and one example of this is the stomach lining our stomach lining is constantly being eroded because of our stomach acid that's a very stressful environment and essentially at a cellular level we develop adaptations to be able to handle that stress now that's at a cellular level when you look at an organ itself however organs are generally in a state of homeostasis because they're able to tolerate a certain level of stress now if you increase the stress too much obviously it's going to exceed their capacity and the organ has to change in order to remain in a state of homeostasis and the way it changes is all based off of the type and severity of the stress placed upon the organ an increase in the stress after a level is eventually only going to lead to the growth of an organ that is very important so there are two main types of growth adaptations that we've already discussed in previous vi previous videos excuse me and you can check those videos out on our channel. But those two types of growth adaptations are hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Now, that is a type of growth adaptation, right? So let's say an organ goes through a stressful uh, event or is going through some stress, uh, you know, it's being placed upon it. Eventually, the organ grows and then eventually the stress goes away. Well, we said earlier that organs are generally in a state of homeostasis. What happens when the stress is relieved? Does the organ stay large? No. What ends up happening is the organ is going to decrease its size and the way it goes through, uh, the, the way it decreases its size to maintain homeostasis is through atrophy. Atrophy allows for the homeostasis of an organ, especially during organ growth. Now, that is one thing that can happen. But let's say the stress does not go away. The stress is constant. It's still there. And essentially, hypertrophy and hyperplasia together is not enough. An organ still isn't functioning properly because of the stress. One thing an organ can do in order to manage that stress is go through a type of change in the cells themselves. And that change is called metaplasia, which is what we're going to talk about right now. So, Metaplasia is the transformation of one differentiated cell type to another differentiated cell type. That's very important. All of this occurs because the change in the stress that an organ is feeling ends up changing the type of cell. This is a type of stress that is past essentially hypertrophy and hyperplasia. It's so constant and it's so regular uh, that the organ cannot maintain proper function just by those two growth adaptations. It has to end up going through metaplasia in order to remain functioning and normal. This is all happening because of cellular reprogramming at the stem cell level. Now recall from our previous video on growth adaptations when we're talking about hypertrophy and hyperplasia. And there, one of those mechanisms also deals with stem cells and that is hyperplasia. Hyperplasia and metaplasia, both of these are similar because they function at the stem cell level. Okay, they are affecting stem cells. In hyperplasia, you are increasing the turnaround of a stem cell, making sure the stem cells are producing more cells, uh, function cells. In metaplasia, the stem cells are being recoded, reprogrammed to create a different type of cell. Now, most commonly, metaplasia actually occurs surface epithelium, and all of this is because the surface epithelium is the most common site of environmental changes. Think about your skin, right? If you're, if you just think about that barrier, that surface epithelium, your skin is constantly under a lot of attack. You're touching things, you're washing your hands, things are abrasive. You have chemicals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You're, you're being exposed to UV light, and that's also damaging to your surface epithelium. So definitely, the surface epithelium is the most common site of metaplasia to occur and all of this essentially happens uh, because metaplastic cells are better adapted to handle the stress that an organ is placed uh, there is that is placed upon an organ excuse me one thing to remember is that metaplasia is actually abnormal okay the normal mechanisms of managing stress are hypertrophy and hyperplasia to a certain limit 
But metaplasia itself is abnormal, should not happen normally because once a stem cell is coded to create a certain type of differentiated cell, it's not going to automatically change. That's not normal. There has to be a stressor placed upon that stem cell that's causing it to change. And those are the environmental factors that we discussed uh, when it comes to an organ and the stress. So one example of metaplasia that you need to know is Barrett's esophagus. This is very important because it comes up on, it comes up on exams and you just need to have a good understanding of what Barrett's esophagus is. Is. Barrett's esophagus is the abnormal, aka metaplastic change in the mucosal lining of the lower portion of the esophagus. Very high yield. You need to understand what is happening. High, uh, high yield AF. So do not forget this slide. Commit the slide to memory. Now, normally in your esophagus, our epithelium, our the epithelial layer is actually stratified squamous, okay? In Barrett's esophagus, that stratified squamous layer converts into simple columnar epithelium with interspersed goblet cells. So you go from stratified squamous to simple columnar uh, epithelium. That is not normal. Normally, this type of epithelium, the simple columnar, is present only in the intestines, in the large and the small intestines. So essentially, you're getting intestinal uh, findings in the esophagus should not be there. All of this is usually occurring because of constant GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. The acid that is coming up from the stomach into the esophagus is eroding the normal stratified squamous epithelium and because of that constant erosion our esophagus converts that layer that little portion from stratified squamous to simple columnar now these columnar cells are better suited to handle the acidic environment and that's why it happens like i said earlier all of this is important to understand because Barrett's esophagus is actually a precursor lesion that can progress to esophageal carcinoma, specifically adenocarcinoma. So Barrett's esophagus, Barrett's esophagus is a precancerous lesion. This is a photo of Barrett's esophagus. As you can see right here, you have your stratified squamous epithelium. You can see the stratification. You can see the squamous uh, cells. And right here, you have the simple columnar epithelium with the goblet cells located right here. Essentially, you can see that this is not a normal esophagus. This is what your intestinal lining looks like, and this is what your esophageal lining should be. This is what Barrett's esophagus is. You should have a good understanding, and you should focus on this photo for a while until you commit it to memory so you know what it looks like if it shows up on exams. Now, that is Barrett's esophagus. Let's go back to metaplasia. Metaplasia, even though it's an abnormal process, it can be reversed with the removal of the stressor that's being placed upon the actual uh, tissue. That stressor, if you remove the stressor, you're going to end up reversing metaplasia. Now, if you don't remove the stressor, you can progress into dysplasia and eventually go into cancer. An example of this, again, is Barrett's esophagus. Same example, but if you don't treat Barrett's esophagus, like I said, it can progress to esophageal adenocarcinoma. It can become a type of cancer. That is very, very dangerous. Now, that is, you know, normal metaplasia. One thing you should remember is that apocrine metaplasia does not lead to cancer, right? Because in apocrine metaplasia, you have reversible transformation of the cells to an apocrine phenotype. And then one example of this would be the breast. In the breast, you have something called fibrocystic changes. These fibrocystic changes can be reversed, and there is a type of apocrine metaplasia. Now, at the same time, you need to remember that there is a type of vitamin that is very important for metaplasia and cellular growth and adaptation, and that vitamin is vitamin A. A deficiency in vitamin A then will lead to metaplasia. Vitamin A is very important for maintaining the specialized tissues in our body, especially the eye conjunctiva. The eye conjunctiva needs vitamin A, and without vitamin A, it can lead to metaplasia, and it can lead to something called cratomalacia. So this is an example of cratomalacia. As you can see, the conjunctiva is cloudy and white. It should not look like that. That is not normal for the conjunctiva of the eye and this is essentially happening because you have low vitamin a levels very very important 
Another thing to remember about metaplasia is that mesenchymal tissue can lead to metaplasia. Now, that's kind of difficult to understand, so let's talk about a classic case of mesenchymal tissue that leads to metaplasia, and that is myositis ossificans. Myositis ossificans occurs because of trauma to skeletal muscles. Now, the inflammation that occurs in the skeletal muscles uh, ends up um, it ends up occurring during the healing process. So you have additional inflammation. This inflammation, because it's a type of stress that's being placed upon the tissue, is going to lead to a metaplastic, pro metaplastic production of bone in the skeletal muscle like you can see right here, right? You're looking at the right hand. This is the right thumb. In between the right thumb and the right first digit, right? first digit, you have, your pointer finger, you have this little ball of ossification, and essentially this happens because of damage to skeletal muscle. It leads to the production of bone in the skeletal mus muscle that should not normally be there. This looks similar to osteosarcoma, but it does not grow off the bone. You, if you look a little bit closer, you can see a clear lining, a clear uh, differentiation between the bone and the myositis, the, the ossification that's occurring in this patient with myositis, uh, myositis ossificans. So that is also another example of metaplasia. So we talked about three main examples of metaplasia that you should have a good understanding of. Number one is Barrett's esophagus. Number two is keratomalacia. Okay. And number three is myositis ossificans right here. All right. These are three classic presentations on exams for metaplasia and how metaplasia occurs as well as the contributing factors. So with that being said, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel because your support really means a lot to us. And we will see you back here real soon.